Yeah. Are you excited yet? <laughs> yeah, just a little bit, right? Well, I want to invite you to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you're new to church, new to faith, we want to welcome you here especially. I remember what it was like to walk into a church when I was 17 years old, having never gone into a church, and it was a little bit different. People were saying things and doing things that I was not really accustomed to, and so we know what it can be like. We want you to know that the reason that today on Easter Sunday we are a little bit giddy is because this day is so significant because it is essential to our Christian faith. It is pivotal. Without the resurrection, we have no faith in Christ. And this is what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you from this theme of if he hadn't, if he had not been raised from the dead, what would be the results? It's the very argument that the Apostle Paul uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If Jesus had not risen from the dead, what would be the consequences of that? What would our faith look like? And so in our church here at the Brook, we believe that Jesus died. We believe that he was buried. We believe that he rose from the dead. That he had a literal, physical, bodily resurrection. And we believe that not because we all got together and decided, hey, wouldn't this be nice to believe? Wouldn't it be cool if we came up with this idea that Jesus is actually alive? We all got together and said, yeah, let's do that. That's not, that's not why we believe the resurrection. We believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ for some very objective, some very rational, some very logical and historical reasons. We believe that Jesus rose from the dead because there was a guy about 2,000 years ago whose name was Matthew. He was a tax collector in the first century. He became a Jesus follower. He saw Jesus die. He saw Jesus' resurrection, and he wrote about it in the Gospel of Matthew. We believe in the resurrection because a guy named Mark, who followed Jesus and traveled all around with him, who was accompanied by a guy named Peter, wrote about and witnessed the resurrection of Jesus himself. We believe in the resurrection because a guy named Luke who was a scientist, who was a doctor, who investigated the claims of Christ, wrote about it in detail in the Gospel of Luke. We believe in the resurrection because a guy named John, who was the first person to arrive at the empty tomb, saw the resurrected Christ, and he wrote about it in the Gospel of John. We believe it because a guy named James, the very brother of Jesus himself. Now think about this for a moment. If anybody could refute your claim that you were the son of God and that you would be resurrected, it would be your brother, right? I mean, what what would you have to do to prove to your brother that you were the son of God? You'd have to be resurrected, right? Your brother would be saying stuff. No, I, I was I was around when he was getting his driver's permit. And believe me, he's not he's not the son of God. No, James witnessed the resurrection. And James, the brother of Jesus, wrote about it himself and proclaimed it to be true. The Apostle Paul, who wrote over half of the New Testament, who was late to the game, he was a friend of all those who crucified Jesus. He was a Jewish religious leader. He himself would drag Christians off in the first century in chains, throw them into prison, persecute them for them to be killed eventually. This very man who persecuted the church of Jesus Christ came to the conclusion that Jesus indeed had been resurrected and he became a Christ follower himself. So we believe that Jesus rose from the dead because we have eyewitnesses, first century accounts, men and women, listen, who had every reason not to believe that Jesus was resurrected, every reason not to believe but who witnessed it, who recorded the account in the scripture for us. Most of these men who recorded the accounts of the resurrection gave their very lives preaching and believing that Jesus was indeed raised from the dead. Objective, logical, historical reasons for the belief in Christ's resurrection. But I understand there are many alternatives to that belief. There are. There are a lot of alternatives. One alternative is to deny God's existence altogether. And we're not even going to talk about that today because 96% of human beings believe that there is a God who exists. So let's just brush that aside. Maybe the other alternative is, well, we believe in God, but we deny Jesus. 
Now, if that is true, you still have to deal with the evidence. You still have to deal with the history. You still have to deal with the eyewitness accounts. You still have to deal with Jesus' claim that he was God. What do you do with that? Was he a liar? Was he crazy? Was he a lunatic? What do you do with that? Because no other major religious figure in any other major world religion claimed to be God. Jesus did. Muhammad did not claim to be God. Buddha did not claim to be God. Moses did not claim to be God. Jesus said he was the Messiah. He said that he was equal with God. And he said that he would rise from the dead. What are you going to do with that? But here's where we're going to camp out today. It's really the third alternative. To not believing in the literal physical resurrection of Christ. The third alternative is this. And this is where the Apostle Paul is going to explain things to us. Is to believe in Jesus but to deny his resurrection. Here's the way that this works. In our world today, there are those who want to divorce the life and teachings from G- of Jesus from his literal resurrection. They want to separate them. And after all, almost everyone appreciates Jesus. Politicians certainly do. <laughs> everyone appreciates Jesus. Everybody likes the Lord's Prayer. Everybody loved the fact that Jesus fed the poor Everybody loves that he loved justice and mercy. We love his sayings. His teachings are so wise. I mean, we love the saying, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's the golden rule. And we like that a lot. There's so much that we like and love about Jesus. We say, I like Jesus. I like the gospels. I like the stories of Jesus. I like the mercy. I like the sayings of Jesus. I like the forgiveness that he offered. I like the love. But come on, this thing about the resurrection... I mean, that's a little too much, isn't it? (laughs) We're too sophisticated to believe that someone would rise from the dead. I mean, we're too intellectual. We're too far along, aren't we, to believe in something like that? We want to raise the morality of Jesus. We want to raise the example of Jesus. We want to raise the teachings of Jesus, but we want to leave his body in the tomb. Here's the inherent problem with that. This belief, a belief like this, to say, well, I want to accept some things that Jesus taught, some things that he did, some things that he said, but the resurrection, not so much. To believe that is basically to have a set of beliefs that is the product of our own creation. It is, it is make-up religion. It is believing on our own something that we've created. It is contrary to logic. We say, well, I just believe that. And I get this a lot, you can imagine, as a pastor. Well, I just, I, it's just what I believe. It's just something that I believe. And, and you say, well, well, why do you believe that? Well, I don't, I don't know. I just, I just believe that. Well, what other area of your life do you make decisions based upon your subjective belief? Well, Officer, I'm sorry, I, I just believe that the officer says, well, great, awesome, here's your ticket, right? Well, professor, I, ju- I just believe that, well, that's fine, great, here's your F. <laughs> There's no other area of life that we submit to our subjective beliefs like that. A guy named Blaise Pascal, a very, very smart dude in the 17th century, Listen listen to what he says. He said this. This is so true about people today. He says, people almost invariably arrive at their beliefs not on the basis of proof, but on the basis of what they find attractive. See, there are those who like to cherry pick what they believe, taking what they like, what they find attractive, what fits, and then rejecting the rest. But you see, in the world of facts, In the world of reality, what you believe subjectively does not determine reality. Do you understand that right? It's the other way around. Reality should shape what we believe. And some might say, well, I want to hang on to Christianity, but I don't know about this thing called the resurrection. Here's the problem. Everything that you know about Jesus, everything that you appreciate about Jesus, the sayings, the stories, the example that you love about Jesus, all of that came from the one who claimed that he was God and who claimed that he would rise from the dead. 
And so, in essence, you must separate some of his truth from other portions of his truth. How can you trust one thing that Jesus said and yet deny something else that he claimed and that he said? You can't do it consistently. You can't do it logically. If this is you, then you must believe that Jesus, by the way, this Jesus, the one whose morality that you respect is the one who lied to you about his claim about being the Son of God and that he would be raised to life. You're saying, well, he didn't lie. He was just delusional. He was just kind of crazy. How can you trust the morality of a crazy man? You see, logically, it just doesn't make sense. It reminds me of what happened to a friend of mine several years ago, this disconnect, this huge disconnect. Uh, A friend of mine who was parked in some place had his Bible in the back seat of his car, and it was the only thing he had in his car, and somebody broke in the window of his car and stole the Bible. It was the only thing missing, stole the Bible out of his car. And I thought, isn't that ironic, (laughs) right? And I'm thinking, how did that story go? (laughs) Here's the thief. He's saying, hey, dude, uh, I stole a Bible out of somebody's car. I broke into a car and stole a Bible. Really? Well, what'd you do with it? I read it. (laughs) Oh, really? Well, what did it say? Do not steal. (laughs) It just doesn't make sense. My older son, when he was real little, did not like to lose. And I think he got that from his mom. (laughs) No. (laughs) He didn't like to lose, so we would play games like hide and seek and stuff. And at the end of the game, if he lost the game, he would go back and want to change the rules. And say, no, that's not it. This is the rule. And I was, Ryan, you can't change the rules after the game. This is what people do with religion. They pick and choose what fits, what they like, reject the rest. It's what I call cafeteria-style religion. You go to Luby's, you pick what you like, you leave the rest. Here's the problem. You cannot say that part of what Jesus said was true without believing that the other part of what he said was true. To believe in something that flows from something else, as is true with the resurrection, all the teachings of Jesus, all the actions of Jesus, all the love, all the justice, all the mercy, all the example of Jesus are founded upon the historical reality of the resurrection. You can't have one without the other. So to believe that something flows from something else but not to believe in that thing from which it flows is ridiculous. It's inconsistent. It's illogical. It's like saying, I believe airplanes can fly. I believe airplanes fly. I just don't believe in the law of aerodynamics. Well, why? Well, I just don't believe in it. See, it doesn't make sense. There's a lot of that going on in today's world. In the Apostle Paul, believe it or not, a lot of that was going on in the first century. So turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The verses will be up here on the screen. They're also on a message outline in your program. Guys, here's the bottom line. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying. Here's the bottom line. If you're logical, if you're honest, if you're consistent, here's the bottom line. If there wasn't a a resurrection, you should, you must abandon all things Christian. If you're going to be honest, if you're going to be consistent, if there was no literal physical resurrection, you should abandon all things Christian. You say, well, man, that seems a little harsh because I like some stuff. Well, we're just kind of gearing up because the Apostle Paul, if you think I'm harsh, you should hear what he has to say. The Apostle Paul, in a letter to the Corinthians, wrote about this very, very thing. There were many people in that church back then in the first century who thought, well, I love Jesus, but the resurrection not so much. We're just too intellectual for that. We're too sophisticated. We're too scientific to believe that a man would rise from the the grave. So Paul addresses this very thing. And here in 1 Corinthians 15, he begins his if he hadn't argument, a powerful argument. So what is it? Well, look down in verse 14. If Jesus had not been raised from the dead, Paul says, first of all, that our faith is worthless. It's worthless. Look in verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. 
Empty is the idea. Useless, worthless. Paul, that sounds a little extreme. Paul, your preaching is in vain? Because, Paul, I like some of the things that you had to say. I mean, that 1 Corinthians 13 passage, that love passage, it's all about love, love is patient, love is patient, all that stuff. I had that read in my wedding. The Apostle Paul would say, don't use any of my stuff anymore in any of your weddings if you don't hold to the resurrection. Because my preaching, our preaching, is worthless without the resurrection. And he says our faith is also worthless. More than that, he says, look, we are false witnesses. That's in verses 15 and 16. The Apostle Paul says, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ. Whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. The Apostle Paul is saying this. Really, listen. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then we, those who preach and proclaim this good news, we are misrepresenting God. He's saying, essentially, we are liars. And we're the worst kind of liars. Because we're not just lying about the news. We're lying about God. We're lying about spiritual things. We're the worst kinds of deceivers. We're, we're lying about a message that people cling on to for hope and joy and purpose in their lives. If we're lying about that, we're the worst kinds of liars of all. We're lying about eternity. Next, verse 17. He says, if Christ has not been raised for the dead, we are unforgiven. Verse 17 says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Wow. Now wait, Paul. I like this part about a forgiving God. I mean, that's really cool. Mercy, love, grace, all that is great. And Paul would say, well, where'd you get that? And you'd say, Jesus. And Paul would say, exactly. The one who claimed he was God and the one who claimed he would rise from the dead. But if you don't believe that he rose from the dead, then we are still in our sins. We are unforgiven we are not cleansed from sin why because it was the resurrection that purchased and bought forgiveness from God that this holy perfect God had to pay a price for sin of you and me and he he brought his wrath of sin the justice for sin was brought upon Jesus in our place for us and the resurrection purchased our forgiveness and without it, we are unforgiven. Next, verse 18, he says, And if there's no resurrection, there's no hope for eternity. Look in verse 18. Then those also who have fallen asleep, that's, that's Bible phraseology for, for those who have died, those who have fallen asleep or those who have died. He says, those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Another translation says are lost. Here's what this means. The Apostle Paul would say, you know, some of you have lost brothers and sisters. Some of you have been to funerals of parents and grandparents. Some of you maybe have even attended the funeral of your very own child. The Apostle Paul would say, I'm not trying to be insensitive, but I just want you to know that if you do not hold on to the resurrection, that those who have died before you are lost. That is the end for them. There is no hope for eternity. Paul would say that idea of heaven that you have, that idea that life goes on, is gone without the resurrection. All the comfort that you've taken in one day that you'll see your loved ones, Paul would say, forget all that. It doesn't exist. The whole concept, listen, the whole concept of heaven is founded upon and rooted upon the historical reality of the resurrection of Jesus. And without the resurrection, we have no hope of eternity. Which leads to the last thing he says. And he, he ups it a level here. Here's the, here's the climax. After all these things, our faith is worthless. We are false witnesses. We are liars. We are unforgiven. There is no hope for eternity. And Paul finalizes it all by saying in verse 19 that we are to be pitied more than all. That's a strong word, pitied. Verse 19, he says, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. If the only thing that you get out of following Jesus is in this life, you Christians above all in the world should be most pitied. Paul is saying you're a fool for following Jesus if there is no resurrection. 
All that money you've given to kingdom work, gone, wasted. What a waste. For those of you who've sacrificed for the sake of Christ, you are fools to have done so. For those of you in difficult marriages where you're clinging to the hope and you're praying prayers and you're believing that God could restore, that God could heal, that God could redeem, that he could bring things back together for you. Those of you who've had that hope of God's healing hand, you're a fool for believing it because it just did not exist without the resurrection. The Apostle Paul would say, pity you. For those of you who serve others, for those of you who worship, so you should have just gone to the lake, like your neighbor. <laughs> just, just, go, just go to the lake. Pity you, you foolish people, for following Jesus. In fact, later in the chapter, the Apostle Paul says, listen, if this is the only thing, then let's eat, let's drink, and let's be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's the phrase he uses. If you don't hold to the resurrection, if you don't, you'll wake up one day and you'll realize that this is the only thing that you have. Poor, pity, soul. That that value system, that code of conduct that you've lived by, that set of beliefs that you believe are right for you, that, well, I just believe, has been rooted of your own creation and not in the fact that God did something in human history. Those are the if he hadn'ts. But it doesn't end there. Because look in verse 20. But. First word in verse 20. But. Now there are two words in the original language in the Greek for the word but, for this conjunction. There's the word de, which means minor contrast, minor difference. If you will, little but. I'm not sure if I can say that in church, but minor, right? Small, small contrast is the idea. And then there's the other word, ala, ala, which means a larger contrast. He doesn't use either one of those words. He puts two words together to form a new word. And that, that those two words are the words nuni, de. And it means indeed, huge contrast, huge difference. He's listed all the reasons that if Christ had not been raised from the dead, what would be the result of that? What would be the consequences? But indeed, in fact, if you look in your Bible, it'll say indeed. It'll add the word to but. But indeed, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. So what does that mean? <laughs> well, that's good news. Because he had just described the if he hadn't. Now he's talking about the but he was. He was raised to life. And so this is what's true. Our faith is not worthless. It is alive. It is real. It is alive just as Jesus is alive. We are not false witnesses. No. We can proclaim with joy and with confidence the good news of Jesus Christ. Knowing that it's true. We are not not forgiven. Instead, we are forgiven. We are cleansed because the one who has conquered sin... And death has won the victory over sin and the grave. Death has died because of the resurrection. He conquered death. Which means this, there is hope for eternity. Those funerals you've attended, the loved one that you laid to rest, if in Christ, there will be a great reunion in heaven one day with those people. We are not to be pitied. We are not to be pitied. Instead, we are to count ourselves as most fortunate and most blessed because grace has been given to us that Jesus would die for our sin and be raised to life and offer that new life to you and me. Oh, we are blessed. <laughs> we are fortunate. And so, because our Savior is alive, you're serving, you're giving, your selflessness, your kindness is not in vain. Your self-control, your discipline, your worship this morning is not in vain. The tears that you've shed when you've hurt and ached within are not in vain. The prayers that you've prayed 
have been heard by your Father in heaven. The strength that you felt when you faced your most difficult days to take another step, to walk one more day, that strength is real because of the resurrection. Because Jesus indeed is alive and that he rose from the dead. The vision of the purpose that God has for you in your life and your pursuit with endurance and perseverance of that purpose is not in vain. It will be redeemed. It will be restored. Because Paul said, Jesus indeed is alive. You go, wow. Yeah, wow. So how? How do we know? Well, let me just run down the list as we finish up today. First of all, the eyewitnesses. We've already talked about them. The eyewitnesses. There were eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, Paul talks about them earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at them in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at what he says. He says, For what I received I passed on to you of first importance. He's saying this is essential. The resurrection is the pivotal part of our Christian faith. Without it, we don't have our faith. He says, What I received, not what I invented, But what I received I pass on to you as first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and uh, was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then the Apostle Paul talks about this in verse 5. And after that, listen to this, he appeared to Peter and then he appeared to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers. Well, he must have done it one at a time. No, Paul says he appeared to 500 people all at the same time, most of whom are still living, he says. (laughs) The Apostle Paul is saying this. Listen, all you guys in the church in Corinth, if you don't believe me about the resurrection, why don't you get a bus ticket and take a trip to Jerusalem and go and talk to the guys that are in Jerusalem who are still alive who can tell you their account of the eyewitness that they saw of Jesus being raised from the dead. They'll tell you about it. They're right down the street. These are the eyewitnesses. And then he goes on to say, then he appeared to James. That's Jesus' brother. Then to the apostles. And last of all, he says, he appeared to me. He appeared to me. These are the eyewitnesses' account. There's fulfilled prophecy. Objective evidence. Words that were spoken in great detail. Hundreds of uh, prophecies. Hundreds of years before Christ would come that would outline the way that Jesus would be born, where he would be born, the kind of life that he would live, the kind of death that he would die, that would prophesy his resurrection. How do you explain that? He's changed history. See, you can refute the resurrection all you want, but you cannot deny the impact of Jesus upon human history who claimed to be God. He changed the course of human history. Not only that, he's changed others. He's changed people, the real lives of real people. Throughout the centuries, hundreds of thousands of doctors and lawyers and bankers and scientists and carpenters and plumbers and nurses and waitresses, people from all walks of life, from every nation, every skin color, every age, non-delusional, non-marijuana smoking kinds of people, People who have had the opportunity, if given the opportunity, would stand up here and say, I was lost, but now I'm found. I've been changed by Jesus. How do you refute that? Are we delusional? Are we just off our rocker a little bit? Is that how people explain that away? Is it true of hundreds of thousands of people throughout the centuries that they're just kind of missing it? No. Real changed lives because Jesus is really alive. That's how. And then here's the the last piece of evidence. So these are all objective reasons, right? Hard to refute. But let me give you one that you can refute. A very subjective reason. There are eyewitness accounts. There's fulfilled prophecy. He's changed history. He's changed the lives of human beings throughout the centuries. Finally, he's changed me. Very subjective, I know. He's changed me. 
as a guy who grew up, grew up not attending church, not knowing anything about God or Jesus, and at the age of 17, someone telling me, God loved me so much that he sent his son to die a cruel, cruel, horrific death. And that he was buried in a tomb. And that on the third day, he rose to life. And that I could know personally this God who loved me that much. That was good news to me. And I accepted Jesus as my Savior. My life has never, ever been the same since then. It's been way far from perfect. But Jesus has changed me. And I got a feeling there's a lot of you in the room today that would say, I know Jesus is alive too because he's changed me. He lives in my heart. And so this is Easter. This is Resurrection Sunday. For some of you, you may have heard this story dozens of times. And maybe today it struck a chord in your heart. It's renewed in you this thankfulness and this gratitude that you have about Jesus and the life that he lives in you and through you. That's good news, isn't it? We should always remember that though once we were lost, now we're found. That's what Easter Sunday is all about. But maybe for some of you, maybe again you've heard it a lot, but today for the first time it's really struck a chord in your heart. You say, I've gone to church, I've prayed a prayer every once in a while, but I've never trusted in Jesus as my Savior this day, Easter Sunday, 2014, could be the day where you come into relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Where you believe in what He did, and you believe in who He was. And you say, I put my trust in the resurrected Savior, and I give Him my life. And if that's you today, I want to give you an opportunity to do that very thing. So let's stand I want to ask everyone to stand. Let's uh, bow our heads. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If this is the day that you'd like to cross the line of faith, place your trust in Jesus, the way that we're going to do that is I want to invite you to say a prayer. Praying a prayer does not make you a Christian. But prayer is the tool, prayer is the mechanism through which you express your faith to Christ, your heart given to Him. So God's looking at your heart, the attitude of your heart more than anything else. And through this prayer, you can place your, your trust in Jesus as Savior. So I want to invite you to pray with me silently not out loud, just silently between you and God from your heart, knowing it's not a formula, but a way of expressing your heart, your faith to God. And if you'd like to trust Christ as Savior, I want you to pray with me. Phrase at a time. Father in heaven, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for my sin. I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Cleanse me. Make me new. I believe and put my trust in who Jesus was. And I believe and I put my trust in what Jesus did when he died for my sins. So Lord, come into my life and make me new. You prayed that prayer today. The Bible says that you're a Christian. The Holy Spirit now lives within you, that you're a new creation. You need to tell someone. You need to let somebody else know who'd be happy for you, who could pray for you. Let us know. Let me know. And you need to grow in your relationship with Jesus. You need to attend a church where they teach the Bible, where you can be with other Christians and grow as a believer in Jesus. And Father, we thank you for this truth today. 
We thank you for this reality. We thank you for its meaning, significance in our lives. And I pray for every believer in this room, Father, that this would be such a special day for them as they reflect upon and recognize all that you've done for us in your Son, Jesus Christ. And that we uh, recognize this pivotal reality of the resurrection of Jesus and all that we gain, so many things, because it is true and it is real. This we all celebrate on this Easter Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great Easter day.